Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. This is the 24th of October. And as always, if this is useful, please like, subscribe, comment, and share, and hit that bell icon to get notified of new content. As always, the chapters are on the bottom of the screen, so you can jump to certain new features or look in the description. New videos this week. So I created kind of a deep dive video thinking about disaster recovery in Azure, and maybe even from on-premises to Azure. So the different considerations, the different technologies, what that holistic solution would look like. I did a really quick introduction video for my DevOps masterclass, now it's all finished. And then super quickly, I did a, why is my YouTube and Twitter handle NTFAQ guy? kind of a bit of a origin story. And actually the reason I did that video is I have some new toys in my kind of little studio. So I've changed my microphone. Uh, I treated myself for my little hobby. And generally sometimes people moan about the audio. I can't hear the problem. I'm not saying there isn't one. Um, but I basically upgraded. So I got myself a new microphone for the studio. It's a Sennheiser Pro Audio MKH416 uh, microphone. And because that's an XLR, I then got myself the Elgato Wave XLR to plug it into. And so that then runs into the PC via USB 3. Now what was interesting, and the reason I did that NTFAQ video was because now the audio and the video are separate, it used to be I had a Rode Video Mic Pro Plus that went into the camera, which is a Nikon Z5. Well, actually there was an audio sync issue. So in OBS Studio, I added a 20 millisecond audio delay. So now the audio syncs with the video. So if you really, really look at my YNTFAQ guy video, you'll see there's a slight offness about the audio and the video. And yes, I know there are lapel mics, I don't want one. So it's not that I don't know they exist, I don't want it. So onto the new feature. So on the compute side, Azure Stack HCI, so that hyper-converged solution that's part of that overall Azure Stack family along with kind of Hub and Edge, has some new features. So really the big thing is it's gone GA. So now this hyper-converged solution that is kind of a special HCI version of the operating system, there are validated hardware solutions. You have two or more nodes um, from an integrated system partner, or you can go through a validation exercise on your nodes. But there's also then the Windows Admin Center, there's Hyper-V, so it is a hypervisor, a hypervisation solution. It's a virtualization host solution. It uses storage space direct for the storage, so it can have it on locally on the nodes, but it appears as one kind of replicated resilient storage solution. It uses software-defined networking, and it can also integrate with Azure hybrid ser services like Arc and Backup and monitoring and much, much more. So 21H2 is the current version, Windows and Linux workloads. Um, it should auto-update for existing users. And some of the new features are kind of GPU support. There are some new processor features, new fin provisioning capabilities, adjustable storage repair speed when there is actually some problem with those storage spaces direct, um, nested virtualization on AMDs. So there's a whole bunch of new things. But basically the big deal is now this is a GA solution, which means obviously you'll start paying for it now um, to the assigned Azure subscription. On the storage side, so Azure NetApp Files now has cross-region replication in GA. So remember, Azure NetApp Files is a native Azure solution using NetApp hardware. So now I can actually configure the volume, so at a volume level, hey, I want a replica in another region. Now what's interesting about this solution is the replication is among the standard Azure paired regions, but it also uses some non-standard pairings as well. So if I'm not using the regular Azure paired regions for my DR, well, I may actually be able to replicate to another region using this. And their documentation does actually go through what those pairings are. So if we go and look at the doc, so we can see, hey, the standard Azure regional pairs, what I could use for that volume level replication, then it talks about non-standard pairs as well. So there are other regions I could use, like, hey, East US 2 to West US 2. That's an option in that. 
And so this is just now uh, available to us. We can leverage this solution. Um, when I set up this replication, it's obviously uh, it's asynchronous because it's along a big distance, but I can set the frequency. So I think there's like 10 minutes. I think there's hourly, daily, weekly, even monthly. Miscellaneous, so Azure Monitor now has this enhanced query SDK. So if I think about, I want easy access to do read-only queries to logs, to metrics, from things like .NET and Java and JavaScript or TypeScript or Python. So what they've actually released is this nice little SDK that makes it feel a lot more natural when you're using those languages. And it gives you examples. So it talks about, well, hey, what are the dependencies you're gonna install based on what language I'm using? And it gives you the example code to actually, hey, go through, authenticate, execute a query, retrieve logs, retrieve metrics, etc. So if I do wanna hook into kind of that Azure monitor logs and metrics, it's now a lot easier to actually do that. Also, Log Analytics is now natively available in West US 3, Korea South and Canada East. So if I'm using resources in those locations, it's now a lot simpler to actually use a local Azure Monitor Log Analytics workspace. And VS Code has been released for the web. Now, VS Code is awesome. Um, you'll see I use it all the time in my demo. So it's a, it's a software package I install. Now, if you've ever used GitHub, you can go to kind of a github.dev, I think it is, where you get basically VS Code in the browser. So that version is very much geared towards GitHub. What we now have is a more generic version that we can leverage. So here I've gone to vscode.dev. There's no installation. This is running 100% in the browser. Now, if I'm using Chrome or Edge, I also get fantastic just kind of access to my file system after I give it permission. Another browser, I may have to kind of upload a file at a time. But you can see I've got this nice experience all running in the browser. I could absolutely go and open a folder. And if I kind of maybe scroll around, let's look at some projects. I'll find one I use a lot. And I can also then hook into my open source, for example. Now notice it's asking for permission. So it doesn't just, hey, I have random access. Do you want to let it view files? Yes, I'll give it permission. And there I can just go and navigate around. Now the experience I get will vary depending on what is kind of the language of the file. But notice here I've got the kind of the color coding. The more webby it is, the browser may have native ability to go and check and get a great experience. But what's nice is this is gonna work on Chromebooks, it's gonna work on iPad. So suddenly I get this really nice experience um, just using this package. So just go to the website and I can easily go and interact with all of my files now. So uh, uh, a nice little new capability. Azure AD Connect has a block cloud only account takeover option. So if we think about the way Azure AD accounts and AD accounts work, and I've got a whole video on what is the relationship, there's a source anchor and the source anchor typically kind of points to this MSDS consistency GUID that's set up in the AD object, which is a copy of the object GUID. Now what can happen is maybe if something's happened and that Azure AD account now isn't part of a Dersync, it's cloud managed, but it still has that source anchor attribute. If I then set up Azure AD Connect, by default, well that account would then get taken over by the matching AD account. And if it's a hard link, what that means is any attributes of the Azure AD account will be overwritten if the same attribute exists in the AD account. So I can set that flag to stop that. I'll actually then get an error. And there's also kind of a soft match that's based on UPN or kind of proxy addresses. Uh, you can also disable that if you wanted. And so in the examples, it gives you what that command will be. I think it's example three. So now it's example two is blocking the soft matching, but then example three, as you can see here, is actually doing that block cloud object takeover through hard match. So then if I didn't want that kind of cloud managed account to become an on-premises managed account, 
um, you can go and turn that on, but just be aware you have turned that on um, because obviously it's going to impact um, creating those matches in the metaverse and everything else uh, going forwards. An Azure Virtual Desktop host pool now has auto scale in preview. So this is the ability now that I can create a schedule. So that schedule could be based on times, based on days, based on certain ser session limits per session host, and then assign that to host pools. So now it's gonna auto scale kind of those VMs that power this, so I can be more optimal with the resources that are actually running and hopefully save me money. Um, so that feature is now in preview. And that's it. Um, I hope that was useful as ever. I'm now off um, driving to Granbury to do the uh, Dallas Spartan Ultra. I'll probably post a little video assuming uh, I survive all the dunking and the climbing and barbed wire stuff. But uh, until next week, take care.